Hi everyone. Today we are going to look at the poem An Introduction by Kamala Das. Kamala Das who wrote under the pen name Madhavi Kutty in Malayalam and later renamed herself as Kamala Suraya was a Malayali writer who lived from 1934 to 2009. Born as the daughter of yet another Malayali woman writer Balamani Amma she inherited traits of writing the genius of writing from her mother but her style of writing was totally different from that of Balamani Amma she wrote about more personal matters rather than colonial experiences Her poetry can be considered as confessional poetry. We'll be looking at the details of confessional poetry in a, in a later part of the session. She wrote very openly and frankly about female sexual experiences and uh, how she had to face oppression being an Indian woman. Her works have been written in malayalam and english and in malayalam she mostly wrote prose in english she wrote poems under the name kamla das in 1999 she converted to islam and was renamed as kamla suraya her major works include summer in calcutta the descendants the old playhouse and other poems which are all poetry collections alphabet of lust padmavati the harlot which are prose works and her works in malayalam include tanuppa balya kala smaranagal enta katha which was later translated as my story this is her autobiographical work in which she became very controversial using because she used a lot of her personal experiences personal matters in uh, her autobiography she told talk, talked about them very frankly so it was a very controversial topic during those times the poem that we are going to learn an introduction is taken from summer in calcutta we'll read the poem once and then move into the analysis part an introduction i don't know politics but i know the names of those in power and can repeat them like days of week or names of months beginning with nehru i am indian very brown born in malabar i speak three languages write in two dream in one don't write in english they said english is not your mother tongue why not leave me alone critics friends visiting cousins every one of you why not let me speak in any language i like the language i speak becomes mine its distortions its queernesses all mine mine alone it is half english half indian funny perhaps but it is honest it is as human as i am human don't you see it voices my joys my longings my hopes and it is useful to me as cooing is to crows and roaring to the lions it is human speech the speech of the mind that is here and not there a mind that sees and hears and is aware not the deaf blind speech of trees in storm or of monsoon clouds or of rain or the incoherent mutterings of the blazing funeral pyre i was child and later they told me i grew for i became tall my limbs swelled and one or two places sprouted hair when i asked for love not knowing what else to ask for he drew a youth of 16 into the bedroom and closed the door he did not beat me 
but my sad woman body felt so beaten. The weight of my breasts and womb crushed me. I shrank pitifully. Then I wore a shirt and my brother's trousers, cut my hair short and ignored my womanliness. Dress in saris, be girl, be wife, they said. Be embroiderer, be cook, be a quarreler with servants, fit in or belong, cried the categorizers. Don't sit on walls or peep through our lace draped windows. Be army or be Kamala or better still be Madhavi Kuti. It is time to choose a name, a role. Don't play pretending games. Don't play at Shinofrisia or be a nympho. Don't cry embarrassingly loud when jilted in love. I met a man, loved him. Call him not by any name. He is every man who wants a woman, just as I am every woman who seeks love. In him, the hungry haste of rivers. In me, the ocean's tireless waiting. Who are you? I ask each and every one. The answer is, it is I. Anywhere and everywhere, I see the one who calls himself I. In this world, he is tightly packed like the sword in its sheath. It is I who drink lonely, drinks at 12 midnight in hotels of strange towns. It is I who laugh. It is I who make love and then feel shame. It is I who, die, who lie dying with a rattle in my throat. I am sinner. I am saint. I am the beloved and the betrayed. I have no joys that are not yours. No aches which are not yours. I to call myself I. In the first section of this poem, the speaker begins by comparing her knowledge of politicians to the days of the weeks and months of the years. Although she does not have a firm grasp on politics itself, those in power have remained in her mind. This shows their power to be much greater than their role should allow. She says that she recalls Nehru who served as India's first Prime Minister after the return of the British. Here, the poet represents all the women. These lines can also be looked at as the general ignorance that women in India have of politics. Generally, the women feel that politics is not their cup of tea. Now the situations have changed, but earlier, during the time when she wrote this poem, that was the idea women had of politics. Yes, definitely, they knew the names of the people who were in power, but they didn't know much about the politics. Then she moves on to introduce herself. It is like a very normal self-introduction. She moves on to describe her own being. She is Indian, she is very brown. Lastly, she is from Malabar in Southwest India. These are the basics of her life, but this is not all about her. Here also, if you notice, she mentions her introduction as a very general, sorry, she men mentions her introduction in a very general note. She says, I am Indian, all Indians are brown in color. She makes it very clear that she is very brown. She is born in Malabar. She does not specify the exact place where she is born, but she says she is born in Malabar, a gen general area. And then she moves on to talk about her, the languages she knows. She describes the uh, 
three languages she knows and the role it plays in her life she says that she writes in three lang she speaks in three languages which is english malayalam and probably hindi she writes in two english and malayalam and dream in one that one language of the dream is the universal language to which everyone else can connect to she moves on to say that she is judged very often for writing in english she whenever she is criticized for how she speaks and writes she feels as if she is all alone there is no one to back her up but everyone else become critics for her everyone she men- she makes that very sp- makes that note very specifically she says every one of you she directs the next line also at this group asking them why they care about what she speaks she talks about the deep connection she feels towards the words she uses and how through her own distortions her own queernesses the language becomes unique it becomes her own signature it becomes hers in the next few lines she continues her introduction she describes herself as half english and half indian she says that this combination is an honest combination and she is she takes pride in being authentic and honest her identity as seen through her voice is human just as she is human not that she doesn't say that she is a woman her voice she doesn't say that her voice is a woman's voice just as i am human but she makes that also a general tra- term it is as human as i am don't you see then she moves on to talk about the control she has over her voice either through speech or text she says that it can display all of her emotions and she talks about the mind that is always conscious that sees and hears and is always aware of the things happening around her she makes a comparison here she says that her speech is as essential to her as it is to crows or lions we never imagine a crow roaring or a lion cawing just like that she says she has her own individuality which she expresses through her language through her half english half indian language which voices her joys her desires and her hopes then she says that her speech is not deaf or blind she says that she means what she says it is not simply like the um, incoherent mutterings of the blazing funeral pyre she says that whatever she says she means and that is what marks her writing then she moves on to talk about the physical changes that she had as she grew up how she became tall her limbs swelled you know the private places sprouting hair and then she talks about how she was dragged into marriage when she was only 16 years old she says when she was young she asked for love because she didn't know what else to ask this ended with her marriage at 16 and the closing of a bedroom door she says that her sad woman body felt so beaten after the sexual experience this line of an introduction is interesting as she places her own body in one of the categories she rebelled against in the first stanza it is due to this simplification of a woman as nothing more than a body 
that led her to marriage at 16. She also places the blame on her own body for leading her to this place. Her distinctly female parts, the breast and the womb, become a crushing weight on her. It signifies the, the pregnancy that she had to undergo. The pressure placed on her by her husband and her family led to an emotional and mental shrinking. And she says that it was a pitiful process. But she doesn't end there. She decides to move on and that's from this disgust towards the body, she decides to ignore her womanliness. That's why she says she put on her brother's trousers and cut off her hair. So she is deliberately getting rid of this female image that has harmed her. Now that she is trying to remake her identity, she is able to say no to the traditions of womanhood. These include fitting in, as she says, fit in or dressing in saris. The categorizers are the people who believe in uh, the proper gender performance. That's why she is constantly asked to uh, behave like a woman. She is asked to be a girl, to be a wife to quarrel with servants, exhibit all the womanly qualities she has. She is asked to belong. So it is very evident how she is trying to get rid of all these restrictions of gender that is placed on her. And then she moves on uh, to say that um, she wonders at her own identity and marvels over the fact that she can now be Ami or Kamala or Madhavi Kuti. So it is by this name Madhavi Kuti that she came to be known. And uh, she also adds, uh, she also talks about a few other reminders on behalf of the categorizers. She is constantly asked not to play pretending games or cry loud. Her role as a woman is supposed to be meek, quiet and contained. She then moves on to describe a time in which she met and loved a man. The person is referred to as a man. He is not named. Now this is one important um, aspect of Kamala's writing. She does not name them, which means she is generalizing them. And also when a person is not given a name, she is stripping that person of some of the agency, which gives him the control over women. And it is also important to know that the name is of little importance as he is meant to represent every man in the world who uses women as he pleases. At one point, she asks the man who he is and he replies, it is I. Now the word I, the personal pronoun I is so important in feminist criticism. The I represents the agency, the power he has in the world. I, when you say, when you call yourself I, you are establishing your individual identity. You are also trying to assert yourself. So when the man says it is I, she thinks about how men have the power and how they make their own decisions and have the ability to use the pronoun in whatever way they want. As she moves into the conclude, concluding part of this poem, she acknowledges the constant presence of I around her. In the world that she is a part of, there are a lot of men who call themselves I. So when the person has this I, the, uh, the 
the feeling of self when the person has this assertion of individuality he can do what or he or she can do whatever he or she wants to now as the lines continue the division between the speaker the persona and the i becomes blurred eventually a reader comes to understand that she is try, ca- trying to come to terms with her own independence and identity as both a saint and a sinner these binary terms need our attention she says i am saint i am sinner i am beloved i am betrayed usually women are either considered as angels or demons there is always this reference to a meek woman as an angelic figure and any woman who just deviates a little bit from this angelic figure to be a demon there is no in between place for a woman so here again when kamala das says that she is a saint and sinner beloved and betrayed she is establishing herself she is saying that i have an in between place to live i cannot be all saint i cannot be all sinner so even as she confesses her own life her own private experiences in her life she is also asserting the fact that her individuality needs to be respected her individuality as a saint as an in between saint and sinner as an in between beloved and betrayed needs to be acknowledged so she states that she has aches which belong to no one but herself she also says that the joys which belong to no one but herself and then she moves on to say that she too can be i so that i figure now moves from this man to this woman the woman when she takes up the role of i she feels a sort of independence she feels a sort of uh, a sense of self which assures her the the liberation that she uh, expects now moving into one of the most uh, significant terms in this poem in this um, session which is confessional poetry so in the beginning we mentioned that kamala das is often known as a confessional poet confessional poetry was a branch of modernism that emerged in the united states in 1950s it can be looked at as a style of poetry which is personal and here most often the poet makes use of the first person narrator it is often i it the the poem mostly moves with the first person pronoun i it is autobiographical in nature and here the authors the writers talk about their private experiences it can be their feelings or fears about death trauma depression and relationships an introduction is also a poem where there are a lot of private experiences mentioned initially kamala das starts talking about how how much of her is indian she talks about how the language she speaks becomes her own and then she moves on from her childhood to her adulthood the transition that she had from a girl to a woman about her experiences in marriage about her sexual life she also talks about how she tries to establish her own identity in this world of patriarchy so it mostly deals with the pro- private experiences and we can rightly call kamala das as a confessional poet we have many other indian poets who are all, who have also written in confessional mode um like mamta kalia imtiaz dhaka and others when we talk about confessional poetry the name we should not forget is that of silvia plath so we find a lot of similarities between silvia plath's poems and kamala das's poems it is also right to look at this poem as a feminist poem 
there is constantly a challenging from the speaker's part regarding the language and the meaning whenever she is asked not to write in english she says that that her language is her, her own whatever imperfections she has whatever perfections she has that is all reflected through the language so she says that you the she challenges the uh, patriarchal notion of language she even takes the name i for herself which is often reserved only for men she takes the name i for herself she challenges the agency of men agency that men assume and she establishes herself so here uh, feminist poems also um foregrounds women's experiences as valid and worthy of attention so whenever kamala das speaks about her private experiences about how she changed from a girl to an adult all those experiences are given enough attention her autobiographical novel my story is also uh can also be looked at from this perspective the focus is mostly on women's experiences from the very private uh from the very womanly of uh her characteristics she calls attention to that private experiences in both her novel and this poem there are references to intersectional oppression intersectional oppression means oppression coming from different sectors for example a black woman is subject to intersectional oppression because she is racially oppressed she is she is sexually oppressed uh if she is disabled in that way she will be oppressed so kamala das also looks at the intersectional oppression she faces she talks about how she is restricted to her house because she is a woman and her own nature of being a brown woman an indian woman how that becomes a uh, a restriction on her she talks about all that ecriture feminine is a french term which means writings of the woman an introduction is also a poem which gives so much of importance as we said earlier it gives so much of importance to language and women's writing kamala das keeps on talking about how language is important for her she talks about how the names that are given are important to her then how the the uh, positions that are given are important to her she talks about all that so this poem can also be considered as a feminist poem now looking into certain technical details of the poem uh this is written in free verse uh there is also enjambment enjambment is uh, a technique in poetry where the lines do not stop with one single line it runs into other lines a sentence runs into two or three lines that is enjambment so she has used that technique here there are also repetitions and anaphora anaphora is also means repetition it is um the similarly starting sentences or phrases to give a particular effect to the poem so this poem as we said basically talks about patriarchy and its strong binding effect on women here the speaker the persona asserts her individuality and subjectivity as i said and there is also a reversal of power positions towards the end because she says i to call myself i so we have one woman who says it is i she also talks about her personal life marriage and sexual life and there are a lot of figures of speech which are used here uh she talks about crows and lions to talk about how uh she uses language 
there is also the reference to the ocean's uh, tireless desire and the hungry haste of uh, river representing the female and male sexualities ocean's tireless desire is the female represents the female sexuality female desire and the hung, hungry haste of rivers suggests the male sexuality so there are many similes of that sort which are used uh, which need to be considered now as we also said before sinner saint beloved betrayal the binaries balance the poem whenever she talks about the categorizers how they restrict her from writing in english or dressing up as she wants she becomes a sinner at the same time there is a balance when she tries to place herself as a saint when she tries to justify her doings similarly when she says that she wanted love she was once a beloved and then later when she felt beaten when she felt failed in her desire she felt she feels betrayed so there is also a balance the binaries that are mentioned here bring about the balance of the poem so that's basically about the poem and introduction please read the poem once more and we'll have further discussion in the classroom thank you